Hi everybody, it's Peter again, and um, some updates and some new things today. Uh, one thing I'm doing is using a different camera and a different mic setup. Hopefully this takes away some of the echo from the shop. It is really echoey in here. Acoustically, it stinks, but um, kind of wasn't built with that in mind. So here's some new things I'm working on. These are diffusers, and uh, what they do is you put these up on the wall behind your speakers, and the cutouts here uh, act as diffusers, and that's a whole lot of BS. This has nothing to do with audio. This is some fun stuff I do on CNC router called V-carving, and pretty interesting process really captivated me when I first started doing it, and these are just uh, illustrations that I, I interpret with software into um, some sort of arty things. So anyway, has nothing to do with audio, but some fun for me. Uh, CNC woodworking has opened a whole new dimension for me and I've been woodworking my whole life and really it was like turning the corner and reinventing the whole thing. But let, to move on, let's um, talk about XLS flat packs. So, Danny kind of um, showed you this the other day and uh, caught me a little bit flat-footed because all of a sudden I'm getting queries about them and I really wasn't quite ready to, to go to prime time. But uh, I am now and so I thought I'd kind of cover the kit and so you could see what you got and, um, and what it's going to cost. So, uh, first of all, cost. Uh, 140 bucks for a pair of speakers and I, I kind of distilled everything down and tried to make it as efficient as I could so I could keep the price low and the way that Danny showed that bundle is actually something I figured out that I can ship it in a certain size box with uh, by protecting it and, and protecting it really well and uh, and shipping it so it doesn't arrive damaged that's my big thing I, when things are drive broken it's bad for everybody. You don't get what you want and I'd have to send you replacement parts and it just doesn't work very well. So my whole aim is to get it in your hands without damage. And so if it looks like overkill, well maybe it is, but better that than the reverse. So parts you get with, the, with an XLS kit, you're going to get um, two rights, two lefts in the sides. And they, at first these were not rights and lefts, they were uh, the same both ways. Now, because of the way I did the braces, I had to make them right and left. And, and there's another video that kind of shows that. I think it'll be pretty obvious if you're putting it together. You'll get two backs, which you'll have your choice of a back with the um, binding post cup or Danny's tube connectors, either one. Um, doesn't matter to me, really. The router doesn't care what it cuts, so. Uh, one or the other, whichever works best for you. Uh, two fronts, uh, Danny pointed out, these are, these are all set up, ready to go. They're radius on the backs so that there's no uh, diffraction in the woofer response. And uh, so you get those. You get two boards to put your crossovers on. And I didn't do any crossover setup here because everybody's going to do it a little bit different and they might be doing it with different parts. So you just set that up the way you want it, keep it somewhere within this area so you can still get to the screws and that will screw right onto the bottom. You'll notice that there's holes in the tops and the bottoms. It's just easier to make that all the same. So the tops are the identical to the bottoms. You don't have to worry which end you put them on and whichever one ends up being the bottom, you can screw that crossover board right down on it. So you get two of those. Four tops and bottoms, and that, of course, is going to cover, again, two speakers. And six braces, which go into the uh, sides and brace all the sides and the, the uh, top together. So you get six of those and the dowels that uh, form the center brace. And if you haven't already seen it, you, there's a video where I show on, on my channel that shows how this all assembles. I really wanted to make it straightforward for someone who um, 
isn't experienced with woodworking or is just getting started or even if you're really experienced it, it kind of is a methodology I developed to make the whole thing come together about as easy as I could imagine it happening and uh, so that covers this stuff I'm gonna set this aside so once again 140 bucks plus shipping I should mention that shipping is something I wish I could control but I can't uh, UPS is, doesn't care what I think. Um, and this box, when it's all set up, weighs about 32 pounds. And it, MDF is not light in weight. So 32 pounds uh, around the country where I've checked. Uh, I'm in Idaho, by the way. And uh, so the shipping probably is going to run somewhere between $30 and $50. So. Wish I could have some control over that, but that's the way it is and something I can't change. So we all have to live with it. Let me set this stuff aside. The next thing I want to talk about is volcanoes. I'm betting you're thinking volcanoes, huh? What's this story? What's, uh, why would he want to talk about volcanoes? So volcanoes in woodworkers world are a little bit different than uh, the ones in Hawaii. And um, so <laughs> in, in woodworking world, a volcano is what, uh, I don't know, somebody coined the phrase, when you drive a screw into almost any wood, what happens is the threads pull up on the wood and happens more with composites. Actually, this MDF is, is pretty resistant to it. So it's uh, uh, the, the harder and denser the product, the less likely it is to happen, but it always happens to some degree. And so when I drive a screw in that, it forms a little bit of a thing that looks, I guess, like a volcano. And that's not a too big a problem, but what you don't want to happen when you install your drivers is to have them perched up on top of these humps. Most drivers have some sort of a gasket on the back, but I like to ensure that it's going to have a nice even contact all around that mounting surface. And so that's why I even address volcanoes. They're real easy to deal with. So I just made one right there. This throw hole was unthreaded. When this comes to you, these will have pilot holes. And those screws that, uh, that Danny sends with his kit will self-tap into those holes and cut their own threads. But by doing that, they create the volcano. So how do you deal with volcanoes? You can do it a couple different ways. This is just a regular drill bit. I think that's a 3 8 drill bit. And once you've done it, you can feel that with your finger. You can sand the top of it off, but it's ideal to make a little bit of a recess, a little bit of a countersink there. And that way, when you put the screw in in the final assembly, you're, pulling, you're not pulling that up, that hump up again. So I just take a drill bit and spin that a couple times. I'm just making a little countersink there. I don't know if the camera will pick that up, but it's not much. It's just enough to take that hump away. You can also do it with a countersink. That's an 82 degree countersink, which is a standard countersink. If you were using flathead screws in some kind of assembly, that's what you'd use to cut the recess for the head. And you can use that too. I just have this, this is a quarter inch drive stuck in a handle. I can't remember where I got that, but you could, you could do this with just a countersink and stick it in your fingers. It doesn't take a lot of pressure, just a little bit of spinning like that. And I would do all the holes before I did any kind of finishing. That way you're starting with something that you're not going to kind of upset later on. I like to pre-fit things and, and assemble them pre-assembly before finishing. And finishing could be, I mean, you could conceivably just put the guts in here, make the crossover, stick it in the box, put some no res in it, and have a really good quality speaker. And you could just leave it like that. Not everybody likes to look at it like that. And uh, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and one more thing I wanted to show you, just in case 
get this out of the road of the camera. If you're doing veneer work, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring that back. I just knocked something down in the hole. Oh shoot, it was the drill bit or the uh, router bit. No, it wasn't. <laughs> Here I am talking to myself. This is, this is a collection system, a dust collection system and something went down in there. I don't know what it was. Um, maybe a screw or a drill bit or something. Anyway, so back to what I wanted to talk about. This is a flush trimming router bit, and if you have veneer cabinets, there's, um, there's a lot of ways to approach veneering, and in the past, before CNC router came into my world, I would have built this box, and then I would have built a jig and used a template guide to cut out these openings. That ensured me that if I were off in some way in my assembly, that the template would get me back on track. So if I had this glued in out of square or something, that the template would kind of make that work. It also made it easier. You could veneer the whole cabinet. I could veneer the whole cabinet, I guess, and then cut the holes and you didn't have to worry about how to trim veneer. And this is, this is easy because there's no rabbit there to accommodate the woofer frame. This is not so easy because you can't get a typical flush trimming bit in there. It's too deep. So this bit, and I will show this and maybe even post a photo of it. I'll, I'll show it to the camera here really close. In fact, this might work better. I'm going to walk up here. And I think the camera can focus on that. So you can see the bearing surface on the bottom of that is really shallow. It's only about an eighth of an inch. So it allows you to get down into that rabbit. This is the packaging and the number on that bit is an Amana or a Mana. I don't know how that's pronounced. A 61204, 51204. And I'll, I'll, I'll take a photo of that and I'll post it at the end of the video. And uh, Tools Today, actually a company I get a lot of tooling from, they, they sell a lot of CNC tooling. They, um, they're real quick. I get stuff, I think they're in Maine or New York or someplace. Um, and I get stuff in Idaho in two days from them, so they're uh, pretty responsive. And so that would be used, if you veneered this, you would veneer this whole thing. And one of the easiest ways to do veneer is with uh, paperback veneer and do, um, there's a glue, oh shoot, I should have talked about that. But it, you know, I'm gonna back up just a little bit. I hope to do some videos that show these procedures that I'm talking about. As, as I progress here. And that way, uh, you know, hopefully if you're doing it for the first time, it gives you a little bit of instruction on, on how to proceed. But let's assume that we're going to veneer this whole thing. And you would veneer over the whole uh, face of it. In, in almost any way that you're going to veneer, that would happen. So when you go to trim it, regular flush trimmer can cut this hole out. But this, because of that lack of depth on the, on the bearing surface, can fit down in that, I'm gonna slide this ahead, can fit down in that tweeter recess and trim that real nicely. Um, guys have done it with X-Acto knives and utility knives, and stuff like that. The cleanest way is with a router. The problem has always been, how do we get a router bit in there? And this sort of solves that problem. This particular bit is the shallowest I've found from here so the bearing surface is the shallowest I've encountered and that makes it real useful for this specific process. I'd actually recommend a bearing guided bit if you're cutting the edges of the cabinet or this out. They just, uh, this is actually called a rub collar and it, it rubs directly on the surface and if you let it dwell in any one place it's going to burn and it's going to kind of make a mess of things. So it, it takes a a little bit of a delicate touch, but um, maybe a little practice on a scrap before you attack your own cabinets would be prudent. Let's see, uh, one other thing I wanted to go. Oh, Danny touched on something that I think is pretty relevant to the DIY, especially speaker world, and that is 
value. Um, one of the reasons I DIY and well, two reasons, I guess I, I'm, I'm a music guy. I'm a, I'm a audio gear guy. I don't know if I'd call myself an audiophile. I don't know how you to define that exactly, but I like music and I like audio gear and I like speakers, but I also really like woodworking. I've been woodworking for a long time and it's, it's a hobby and I kind of combined it in a remodeling business for a good many years and uh, I still enjoy it after all these years. So it allows me to kind of combine two things I really like and that's woodworking and, and uh, music and audio gear. So it was um, kind of a natural for me, I guess, but the, the, the value equation there is, is real. I mean, when you look at, let's say, let's just take this speaker as an example. I think Danny said, you know, even if you took his kit and, and took it to the max with all the upgrades in the crossover and purchased these and put them together, and let's assume that you didn't finish it at all. You just maybe rounded over these front corners, which would be a good idea, and put it to work. You would have a mini monitor that's really high quality. Perhaps you could get better in the industry, but you'd spend a lot more to do it if you went out and bought something. And so there's that value equation. And, and it, on, on smaller stuff like this, it's based on, okay, what's it cost to build? And then it goes through those steps of escalation of cost that get further and further away from actually anything to do with the sound quality. It has to do with marketing and movement of stuff around and shipping and, and margins at retailers. There's just a whole bunch of things that factor in that just aren't here. You're dealing on a really grassroots level. You're, you're dealing with people who are kind of direct to consumer. That's the way uh, I am certainly and, and the way many of the cottage industries, and I'll call them that because they're not Amazon, they're not Target, they're not big corporations like that. They're just not. And I think there's a huge bang for buck available there. There's another thing that comes into play. I've always been a little bit of a student of marketing and, and when it gets into the kind of opposite end of the stratospheric end of audio, there's another marketing thing that factors in and it's not based so much on cost of parts, cost of delivery, cost of margins at dealers, but uses a kind of a different model and that's what the market will bear. And that is often completely driven by marketing. So if I can convince you that this $500 speaker is worth $10,000 and I probably won't be able to do that, but it's, it's done and maybe that's an extreme example. And, uh, but through marketing, through advertising, through doing lots of kind of public, uh, what do I want to say, um, exposure, that, which by the way, all costs money. I mean, none of that stuff happens for free. And it, so, the extreme high end can just be nutty in terms of what you get for your dollar. If you're looking for sound quality, um, I'm not saying that DIY is the only place to get it, but if you like the idea of building your own stuff, making it look like you want it to look and having that sort of experience, it can be a really fun place to be. So um, let's see, what else do I want to cover? Oh. All good woodworkers um, need licorice. <laughs> now nah, I just like the licorice. <laughs> so I'm going to sign off for now. I hope that I've answered some questions that have uh, not been answered prior. And if I've forgotten something, uh, please email me or put it in the comments and I'll, I'll get back to you. And by the way, you're, you're dealing with the guy who does all this. I'm the I'm the CNC guy, I'm the programming guy, I'm the guy who answers the phone, I'm the person who 
who will pack it up and ship it to you. So it's a real grassroots thing. My whole idea was to keep costs down by not adding layers upon layers upon layers of costs. And when I have websites and checkouts and things like that, that's going to that's going to necessarily do that. And maybe someday it'll be that, but it's not that now. So that's, uh, that's kind of where I'm coming from. Uh, once again, oh, you know, and another thing too, if there's stuff that, uh, that you want to see, uh, techniques that I might use or equipment or whatever, uh, you know, I'm always, I got all this new camera gear and I'm kind of having fun doing these videos and it seems like a really cool way to reach a lot of people in an almost instantaneous way, which is um, something I've never really experienced before. So if there's something you'd like to see, let me know and, and uh, I'll put it in the hopper and, and see if I can make it happen. So once again, thanks for watching and uh, if, if you happen to get these and, and you're building them, I think everybody on Audio Circle, which is kind of my haunt, loves to see pictures of people's finished products. And there's also a lot of people there that will answer questions, including me. Um, if you've got them, if you run into snags, whatever. So I'm going on and on, so I'm going to cut it short and uh, call it a day and get this up and posted so uh, the information that it was sort of sorely missing, is, is no longer missing. So uh, thanks again for watching, and um, I will see you next go. I don't know exactly what that will be, but it'll be something. So see ya.